You are listening to a White Phosphorus Pictures podcast. Broadcasting under the night sky from the edge of an undisclosed jungle on the Gulf of Mexico, I'm Christopher Garitano, your voice in the night. For the next hour, allow me to be your guide into the bizarre unknown, the fantastic macabre, and together we'll journey to that borderland between fiction and reality, a place beyond all rational explanation. We are now off to the witch. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Off to the Witch newsletter. For those of you who are new to the show, the newsletter occurs every other week. On our regular weeks, we have a guest and a solid theme, and I've kind of incorporated a a theme into the newsletters now. It was originally created to just be a quick newsletter on the weeks that I needed more time to work on current projects uh, that are kind of building right now. One of which is A Haunting We Will Go. It is the first feature-length special, and it will be an ongoing series of investigative specials that I'm going to continue to make as long as I'm interested in making them. You know, as you as you may already know, I've made several shows for network TV, and um, my last series, uh, Strange World, was a gargantuan effort uh, to create it. And in the end, I just felt with the amount that was put forward uh, at the end of the day, when you have people kind of shaving off things that are important, Uh, For the final result, I really wanted to just take my time and create these things exactly the way I planned. And A Haunting We Will Go is coming out beautifully. I shot another one, uh, tentatively titled Monsters Among Us, a very unique take, once again, on um, gator and croc attacks in suburbia. And, um, you know, I grew up in New York where a gator attack was an urban legend, And, uh, you know, I grew up watching creature features like Alligator and other Animals Gone Awry movies. Another one was, uh, it wasn't Gators, but Savage Harvest, where uh, these big cats were around a ranch and the people were trapped inside and people were getting devoured by these cats one by one. Crazy movie to see as a kid. That was my exposure to these kind of uh, giant animals gone awry, especially a a, a giant reptile like a gator. I mean, that's very foreign to uh, New York. However, I did my research, and some of those urban legends about the alligators and the sewer systems actually is a true thing and have since come to fruition. And so I moved, you know, many years later. I I lived most of my life in New York, and then I I lived in Michigan. And then I moved over to uh, Florida, where I am now. You know, I've only been here for, uh, I don't know, six or seven years. And the reality of being eaten by a gator is... As something that people have to deal with out here. I mean, like, you know, there are many accounts of people simply not even just swimming in the canal systems or, or any of the lakes, uh, rivers, but walking their dog, walking their dog in the backyard and getting devoured by a, a essentially a prehistoric beast. Scary stuff. So I wanted to make a an episode about that that had no regulations. As much as I appreciate and am grateful for every network project that um, I'm able to to bring to fruition, uh, in, in my previous collaborations, you know, you have to give away some. So I wanted to make first for me. I wanted to create these things exactly the way I had planned. Let's see how they come out. Personally, I think they're the best things I've made in that genre. And... Um, Also, another project uh, that has finally come to fruition is a bit different than my investigative shows. You know, at my foundation, I'm a filmmaker, and um, within that spectrum of being a movie maker, you know, because you can label yourself as a director, a cinematographer, an editor, these are all just crucial aspects to movie making. Uh, Because it's so much, and that's why most of the time, especially professionally, people need to um, almost 
compartmentalize the collaboration because we need expertise in each of those areas to get it done on time, to bring it into fruition for a deadline. And I understand that because I'm also a professional. But at the same time, I'll never be able to shake how much I care about the work, how much it means to me. And not unlike the relationship between a painter and the canvas, I have those feelings towards movie making. Um, and I'm able to separate myself uh, from that, that singular point of view when it's time to collaborate. And when you have the right collaborators, sometimes, you know, you're coupled with people that uh, don't really care. Luckily, right now, I'm, I'm with people that care as much as I do. So I'm, I'm happy to collaborate with these people. I can't say much else about the project right now, but it certainly is a dream project. It's something I brought to um, this collaborative production company and the network, and now it's now it's a reality. So it's going to be an ongoing thing and a series of movies. That's the best I can tell you right now. It'll be an, it'll be announced later this year, and uh, you'll find out more. So this book that was published in 1990, The Black Hope Horror. And it was written by Ben Williams, Gene Williams, and John Bruce Shoemaker. And, you know, I was always, since I was a little kid, I was always on the lookout for another ghost story to give me nightmares. I don't know why I kept testing that. It was like you put your finger on a hot stove and you kept doing it over and over again because I would, I would be plagued with nightmares at night, so it would constantly attract and repel me, these ideas. And this has been since I was a child. A lot of that is going to be in a haunting we will go. I'm trying to establish that because I know I share that with many of you. And um, I made a haunting we will go knowing that many of you are going to relate to it all. Our fascination with this is all there. I couldn't possibly just make another, um, you know, Ghost Adventures episode. I mean, you have to be a moron to go and want to do that again, you know, after it's been done thousands of times. I took this broad stroke concept and did something very unique with it, and I think you're going to love it. And so the Black Hope Horror is one of those things along the way that um, inspired thought uh, nightmares, a whole combination of, of reactions. And I think, you know, as an explorer, you know, I see myself as an astronaut. We're not here forever. We're leaving at some point. So I'm on this planet and we are on this planet to, to experience and explore and question things. I've been that way since I was a kid. And so even the nightmares are part of the exploration. I have vivid dreams every night. And lately, I've just been so interested in going into that dream world that when it's time to sleep, I, I make sure there's no television on, there are no lights on, that it's completely dark, and then I'm entering this other world for a while. And I try to remember as much as I can when I wake up. Well, in this story, the Black Hope horror, whatever was there, whatever was in this subdivision um, just outside of Crosby, Texas, was plaguing people's dreams, was creating sounds in the middle of the night when they were awake. There were apparitions in the hallways. There were images of uh, rotten corpses walking through their hallways. Now, I don't know about all of you. I've heard from some of you that We've also seen things like this, and then we've heard accounts just like there was um, by Ben Williams and Gene Williams throughout history, throughout human history. We've all seen things, and you get the occasional person that always tries to challenge it, um, very smugly too, as if I you know why are there no spirits of Neanderthals. Well, that's a silly question. How do you know whatever spirit you're encountering actually is? How do you know if you haven't experienced spirits of Neanderthals or dinosaurs or whatever? I mean, like, we don't know. So that's a silly question. There hasn't been enough scientific, geophysical, psychological research to find out anything, honestly. And before I get further into the Black Hope horror, um... I want, I want to recommend a book um, by a man named Dr. Barry Taff. He was one of the only 
legitimate parapsychologists uh, beginning in the late 60s throughout the 70s. He was working in the parapsychology lab at UCLA uh, with Dr. Thelma Moss. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic because Barry was brought on as a consultant for the motion picture Poltergeist. Not only that, he was also brought on as a consultant for the movie The Entity. Both of those motion pictures, especially The Entity, of course, are, are based on Barry's investigation in California in the early 70s. And it was of a woman named Doris Beither who, out of the blue one day, just was assaulted by this invisible force. Now, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about this um, throughout my life. You know, there have been accounts of it that I've seen on television shows and in real life. You know, I've had a few people confide in me that they were attacked by something. Some people won't tell their full story. You know, just like it's difficult for people to admit they've been assaulted by a human force, um, they, it's awkward for them. It's, it's a horrible thing. They don't want to relive, and they're, especially if it's an unseen force, how, how do, you know, they're worried about being labeled insane. So when you have millions of eyewitness accounts and thousands upon thousands of, of accounts of poltergeist activity, people getting assaulted by ghosts, hit by ghosts, you know, and I'm using the word ghosts because we have to call it something in this conversation. I don't know exactly what these things are. And I've had an experience myself, a couple of them actually, that are hard to explain. And when I got to um, pitching Strange World uh, for Travel and Discovery Channel, I brought up the Black Hope horror because I thought that epitomized, it was a story that was lesser known and, and lesser discussed and it really epitomized all of that phenomena into one tale. And I, I wanted to focus on this incident in Crosby, Texas, uh, for the Deadlands episode. However, as it goes, and as I mentioned earlier, the network, uh, certain people tried to manipulate the episode into something else that, again, it's not a terrible episode, but it's my least favorite. You might really like it and enjoy what happens in it. Um, there was so much more shot for it that I felt that we lost a lot. But I'm going to leave the link to that episode in the description. You can watch it for yourself and enjoy it and tell me what you think of it. So originally this episode called Deadlands was about, and, it, and still is, it retained its essence of what I pitched, was about desecrated ground. But I really wanted to get into what that means. Why? Okay, so in the case of Black Hope, Black Hope was the name of the slave cemetery that was in that area in Crosby, Texas. And what happened was, you know, as it's probably happened more than you want to know, there the land developers, okay, and, and this is brought into story when it was discussed in Poltergeist, only moved the headstones, okay? They, have, they find land, they have cemeteries that go on and on for acres and acres, and in vulgar disregard, they just take headstones and move them, but the bodies are still underneath you. Now, I'm going to get to what could happen in that case, because we have old fables and stories about desecrating sacred ground, I mean, and what the penalties are. You know, we have warnings of that that go way back into ancient folklore. So... You have an old slave cemetery. You have people that were just destroyed. Everything they have, controlled, destroyed, beaten, violated, everything you could think of. And their only resting place was not only in vulgar disregard, only moved the headstones. They didn't even move the headstones. They just leveled the headstones, <laughs> erased it from history, and built this hamlet over it. The people moving in had no idea. I mean, I guess spiritually or, or, or morally, you couldn't blame these people. They were naive to what 
the area truly was, until later. But the land developers knew, and they didn't care. And so they just built these houses over a, a cemetery that should have been preserved as long as humans were walking the earth. These are, these should be respected. These are people's final resting places. But they're not. So this housing development is built. And you had people like Ben Williams and Gene Williams uh, excited to move in. And so I'm going to read you a little passage from the Black Hope Horror. And this is, um, I'm going to read you just a, a passage from chapter three. And I'll probably read a couple of things from the book, but I recommend you go out and find it. And I'll, I'll leave a link in the description where you can get a copy. I know it's somewhat out of print, but you can find old copies of it. So this is chapter three, late October, 1980. They'd been in the house less than two weeks and already Jean was having some misgivings. For one thing, even though it was typically mid-fall weather, she always felt cold in the house. She'd go around turning up the heat and Ben would go around turning it down, worried about utility bills. Jean also had uneasy feelings that she couldn't put into words. She felt at times that she was being watched, though by what or whom she couldn't say. She didn't share these feelings with Ben, and that made her even feel more strange since they always shared everything. She was afraid to express it. She didn't want Ben to think she was unhappy in their new home. Often she felt as if it, whatever it was, came from outside, from the backyard. It was almost as if she could feel a current of cold coming from the ground directly to her. So what started off as just odd feelings. Um, and that's a phenomena that happens in a lot of places. And I'll, and I'll tell you what I'm getting at with this discussion tonight. You know, it's, it's trying to understand why these things happen. And if there's more to it than just the structure being built over what essentially are graves, there might be a combination. But we'll never learn this combination unless there's a serious study. And it has to be a scientific study. It has to be geophysical. It has to be psychological and parapsychological. But what I'm talking about is something different, and it's something that Dr. Barry Taff explored his entire life. He wrote a book called Aliens Above, Ghosts Below. Check it out. You could learn about what a parapsychologist does by reading that book. Great book. And, um, you know, in addition to the Black Hope Horror. And I'll put a link also to Barry's book in the description so you can find it. So what is happening here? Why was Jean and Ben Williams having these feelings, right? And this recalls a moment where I came to the realization where you have people who suddenly go into dark times. And I mean like a couple or a family that got along great before they got to a location and then mysteriously everything starts going downhill. Now, I don't want to attest everything to dark spirits or bad energy, but how would we ever know if it's something like that or a deep depression that suddenly comes on out of nowhere? It could be physiological. You know, there, there are a lot of ways to try and figure this out. But unfortunately, when someone hits that deep anxiety or deep depression, immediately they're seeking help, as anybody would, and then you have a doctor prescribing them medication, which only either masks the problem or makes the problem worse in a lot of cases. In some cases, it, it's people swear by it and it's helped them, and that is not my place to uh, disagree with that. However, could it be something else bringing on the symptom? And if we were just simply to explore these things uh, with an open mind and, and a scientific steps forward, we might find out exactly what's happening. Barry Taft felt it could be several elements that are, are inspiring the phenomena. You know, when someone goes into a location and they're not only feeling depressed, but now they are having these kind of physical, um, environmental effects, and then they're seeing things. And it's not just one person seeing these apparitions. It's a family. You know, people are seeing them one at a time. There's got to be something going on. There could be a combination of elements, and I think that's what 
the greatest uh, scientists in parapsychology are understanding that it's a, it's a combination. It's not just one or the or the other, because the other reality is that a good deal of our homes are built over graves. Just imagine for a moment the amount of people that have expired uh, even before settlers came to what we now know as the United States. Think about the amount of people that have expired and have been buried underground. I mean, it might occur to you that, uh, let's say, just in this country alone, and this is around the world, of course, but I'm in the United States, so I'm saying in this country alone, in the U.S. alone, we might be over one giant burial ground. Okay, that's the reality of it. A lot of people don't want to face that reality. Uh, So on top of that, why is it that only certain areas have these extreme activities? And, and, and how is it affecting us? There have been scientists like Michael Persinger that have explored this um, through geomagnetic waves, simulating them with things like the God Helmet or the Haunt Box. And so, you know, this is my interest to further these ideas, to discuss them as philosophy, to discuss our interest, to celebrate our interest also, because I, I love a good ghost story. Um, but it, I don't think it takes anything away from the situation to try and figure out, well, what are, what are the combined elements of it all? And yes, there are things that are working on a spiritual level as well, but why? And the thing is that science can help you map that out to measure it. Science hasn't, I, I would say for the most part, science has ignored this, or at least to our knowledge. We, there's also evidence to support that governments around the world have been experimenting in in parapsychology and to uh, other dimensions and to measuring what these phenomena are and perhaps even weaponizing them. There, there's evidence to support that throughout. It's just they've kept it from us and 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 left it into uh, into folklore for the most part. But if we were just to think about these things, you know. Do you just suddenly feel bad when you walk inside a place? There have been structures that I've walked into. You know, for many years I was installing um, industrial and residential uh, hardwired alarm systems. Essentially, it was a construction job. There was a lot to it. And, um, you know, burglar alarms, fire alarms, uh, you know, we would do entire buildings, schools. uh, You know, it was a big construction job. So there was this one time that it was a residential home but there was something about it that I truly felt that this used to be a, a funeral home and a mortuary because it was equipped with those things. It brought on a, a story that eventually became The Haunting in Connecticut, um, but it was a book called In a Dark Place. And it was like when I read that book, I was like, wow, I just experienced something like that. And I did not know this. I didn't have this in my head. And of course... You know, I love ghost stories, but I was never the one to just walk into a place and just just make things up. I, I That I, I felt was, it's not authentic. And even to this day, I don't enjoy that. I want to feel it. If I don't feel it, then I'm going to tell you. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not feeling anything from this. You know, it could be me um, or it could be that there's nothing here. But the, I do believe there are things that have happened all over the world and throughout history. So... I walk into this place and immediately I've get immediately I have this dark feeling. And I'm looking around at the geography on how the basement was built. Um, there was like a, a garage where I it just, you know, started matching up. There was a drain in the basement. All of these things met up to a very similar case. Like I said, the haunting in Connecticut. It was almost identical. And we worked there for a couple of days. And I was telling my partner at the time, I, you know, like the guy that worked with me, I said, um, hey, man, this, is, this place was a mortuary. And he's like, yeah, I, I, I think it was. It was something. You know, they had, an, they had a, like a gurney, an operating gurney down there and everything. But it was not for the current residents. You know, these people were just moving in and they wanted an alarm system. So it could have been a funeral home that was purchased at a decent price. And I don't know why... I've been in funeral homes before and I didn't walk in with a dark feeling. Um, 
you know, maybe a feeling of sadness or, or even a feeling of peace, but never, never a dark feeling. And in this place had it. So I wonder why. And it wasn't just my imagination because my experiences with the unknown and, and true ghost encounters, if you want to call them that, are few and far between. So and I, my imagination's running wild all the time. So I, I would, you know, the house I'm in right now, I haven't had any odd experiences at all. And, you know, I've been diving into ghost stories and everything you can think of since I moved in. Um, and every now and then I'll spook myself out a little bit, but um, not to the point where it's been severe. I, my apartment in Michigan, though, that was, something was heavy over there. And I felt like, you know, even, even my girlfriend at the time, we were having strange arguments that we weren't having before. Uh, there was a heavy presence there. I felt one night like something was jumping on me, like energetically. There was a, something ascended upon me. And I did see an apparition one night. I wasn't imagining this. I was standing in the living room. I was on the phone. You know, my girlfriend at the time was in the bedroom sleeping. And I saw someone out of my periphery walk down the hallway and into my office. And I know what I saw. Uh, but I can't explain it. Can't tell you what it was. And I think perhaps the next stage in ghost hunting should be a review of these older tales. Let's not try and um, over-sensationalize them. If we have this foundation and this basis of science, then we can expand it. I, I approach the Montauk project that same way to this moment. You can, listen, I've heard all the stories about the interdimensional Sasquatch monster, about uh, over and over again from the source, okay? I sat with Preston Nichols. I sat with Al Bielik. I heard these stories over and over again. I recorded them for my film and I illustrated them for the film. But um, where I'm at today is I want to remain on a foundation, a strong foundation, and inch my way outwards, because once you can start to prove, let's say, there is a structure underneath the ground, there is a base there, then you can start to imagine, well, what did they do there? And move from there. And I think that's the greatest thing you can do for history and for record. Same with ghost encounters. Let's first establish that we have millions and millions of eyewitnesses throughout history. And in any court of law, if millions of eyewitnesses showed up, that would be more than enough to prove that something is real. However, we're, we're still taught that this is for entertainment purposes only, for the most part. And I wonder, who's teaching us that? Especially when we have governments that experiment in the paranormal scientifically, and we have evidence of it. There are those who say that this quiet town holds many secrets. Legend has it that beneath this very tower, a dark force had its eyes set on the children. We were told that what was going on there was for the benefit of humanity. What would you say to the people who say, well, all these children were kidnapped and murdered and you were a part of it. What would you tell them? You I tell did them? approve of it, but there was nothing I could do about it. They wanted a large number of programmed boys to be used for mind control operations. And there are others who say it's still happening to this day. I don't know, I for myself find it a little suspicious that all the evidence has been conveniently destroyed. Let's put it this way. If you're sitting there with 20 guns pointed at you, what are you going to do? Whatever the hell they want! 
Watch Montauk Chronicles now for free on Tubi, Plex, Roku, and available for download on Amazon and Apple TV. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. In a way, our view on hauntings and poltergeist activity and entities and these things that have happened, you know, because we have eyewitness accounts, and I'll get to a very credible one in a moment. This involves Barry Taff, but you have all of these eyewitness accounts. You have stories like the Black Hope Horror, um, and I'll tell you where it went in a, in a moment, but over and over throughout history, you cannot deny this phenomena. You cannot deny it. It's happened so much and to so many of us that either, you know, officials don't want to even bother with it because it's, in their minds maybe there's no proving it or they're using it for something and they don't want us to acknowledge that it's a real thing. And... I wonder why. And so the only way we're really going to, um, I guess, further explore this situation is with science, because we can talk about folklore until the end of time, but you're never really going to get anywhere. So I think a true scientific analysis, re-reviewing older cases, and, and learning about the geography of the area, the combination of people in the house and the phenomena itself, how long it lasted, how severe it got, the reports. And then what you have to do is contrast and compare that to other areas that might not have those elements. And then you start to break it down and figure out, okay, so what's conducive to all of this? What's, what's really inspiring this? And then if you can recreate that as an experiment, bring all of those elements into one place, and if it's a, a geophysical element also, it has to be a place that has that in combination with all the things that were working for each of these cases. I would say pick you know, 10 of the strongest cases throughout history and try to analyze that situation. Every element. How old were the kids? Um, Barry Taff felt that a lot of these cases happened when you had um, kids coming to age, adolescence, even um, younger kids, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14 in the house, um, that this was a conductor as well. Something about that was happening with those kids at that age was inspiring this situation. Then there was the location. What was it built upon? What is the sediment mainly beneath the ground? Is there water beneath the ground? You know, these are, these are good questions, and I, I, rarely are these questions asked, and, and, and it's made more as um, entertainment in a lot of cases, but I'm always thinking about these things. So, back to the Black Hope Horror for a second. The Black Hope Horror was occurring between 1980 and 87, and um, this, it's interesting because movies like The Entity and Poltergeist came out during the decade of this this haunting and there were probably a, this was probably a phenomena that was happening elsewhere because you know poltergeist was semi based on a, a twilight zone episode called little girl lost these stories have been out there for a very long time they're things that people have experienced the black hope horror got so severe that people were actually dying what was it about the the, the essentially oppressed energy in that place, offended, 
much like a native burial ground or, or something like that, that it was just so offended by this housing development being built over it that it was a curse on anybody, no matter how they behaved. You know, for instance, um, two of the residents were there and their 30-year-old daughter came uh, and they were digging in the, in the rose garden and they found a skeleton. They found wedding rings. They found all these things in, in, the, in their rose garden and they felt terrible for these people. Reinterred them, tried to say something nice, tried to apologize, you know, spiritually apologize. Wasn't enough. The daughter died in the process of digging. She had a heart attack right on the spot. People were getting sick. People were getting cancer. Whatever this was, was this, if you were to say it was a spirit, it was a very angry spirit. And um, let me read you a page from the Black Hope Horror. So this is 148. Now this is a, a chapter from the Black Hope Horror where a woman named Audrey Anderson was away and then she returned again to the location and whenever she was away she was fine but getting closer to that area in that hamlet um, everything would start coming back again so audrey anderson felt the stress mounting again she was seeing shadows hearing footsteps regularly news of the black hope graveyard infuriated her and made her more afraid. She was appalled that Purcell had built over an old cemetery and found it difficult to believe they hadn't known. And they knew. Things were deteriorating all around her. She and Raymond weren't communicating. He'd lost his job and they were having financial difficulties. They wanted to leave but couldn't afford to abandon their home. Their chances of selling now seemed slight. With Raymond job hunting, Audrey was often home alone with Jason, their young son. One night she was awakened by a peculiar sound. It seemed to be coming from the den. She switched on the light and started down the hall. The racket was growing louder. Audrey felt her heart beating faster. Now she could not only hear something but see it too, something moving toward her from out of the gloom of the den. She froze and then let out a sigh of relief. It was Jason's robot toy more than two feet tall and was operated by remote control. After relaxing momentarily, Audrey tensed again. Jason, she said softly, fearing the sound of her own voice. It was the middle of the night. What would he be doing up at this hour? Jason, she said more firmly. No answer. She switched on the den light. The robot was still coming toward her. She spotted the control panel across the room. Jason was nowhere in sight, feeling a prickly, creeping sensation along the back of her neck. Audrey hurried past the robot which was blinking and clanking noisily, and hit the off button. Immediately, the racket stopped. You know, it sounds like it's right out of a movie, but these things actually happened. And it's odd how um, life imitates art. You know, these things were also happening before Poltergeist even came out. And, you know, I, I mean, the, the actual director of Poltergeist, which was Toby Hooper, was from Texas. He may have heard some of these stories through friends. You never know. And then they incorporated part of that into the script. Uh, we may never know. So, but I think this phenomena occurs more often than not. Many of my guests have told me stories like this. So maybe, you know, movies like the entity and, and poltergeist resonate with us because it's more of a common occurrence than, than not. You know, keep in mind that in, in Barry Taft's case, and you'll read about this in his book and you can see about it in several documentaries if you uh, look at some of the extras that were on the either the poltergeist um, Blu-ray or the entity special edition, and you can get that from Scream Factory, that it wasn't just Doris Byther that was talking about this phenomena that happened to her. There were eyewitnesses. There were people that saw this apparition with her, and they were from the parapsychology unit at UCLA. So their whole determination was to not lie. They looked at Barry looked at hundreds and hundreds of cases, and he has to walk in with doubt. He has to try and disprove it. And that was apparent in some of the people in 
and Poltergeist that were represented, they were all based on the dynamic of Thelma Moss and Barry Taff and uh, Carrie Gaynor. Uh, so those, that whole parapsychology unit and Poltergeist was them. And if you remember, the two gentlemen were trying to disprove the situation. They said, maybe it's coming from a transmitter upstairs. That's their job as scientists. They have to try and disprove it. They can't just listen to some dude telling them, you know, I saw an asparagus person jump out of the wall and try and eat me. Well, okay, I, I, I listened to your story, but let's go to that wall and take a look and let's analyze it. Let's listen. Let's stay there for a night. Let's see if this phenomena happens to anyone else. That's the only way we're going to be able to, to get this stuff in the books for us as, a, as humans to try and understand it. That's why science is so important. And I, I get frustrated when people disregard science and say, well, it's only this and it's only that. Well, you need to use it. Science is just a measuring system. Science isn't the spiritual. The spiritual exists. In my opinion, we use science to measure these things. So we need it. Um, if you want to go any further with this stuff, and, and there's so much to do because we haven't, you know, we, ha we haven't gone further with this. So using your imagination and experimenting with this stuff uh, is important. And I guess I picked the Black Hope haunting to talk about in this newsletter because the one thing, and they call it the Black Hope curse, that is really scary. And, and and unlike many other hauntings, where yes, you know you, you know you'll hear voices. I I, I heard this whispering uh, two nights in a row when I was fourteen, and you never heard it again or before that. And uh, but I wasn't hurt by it outside of being fearful of it, not understanding what it was. But in the case of the entity, and in the case of the Black Hope curse, people were not only getting hurt, they were dying, they were getting ill, they were getting sick. Is there a vengeful spirit? Were these spirits so offended that these people were dying or was there something else there? Did it have anything to even do with the cemetery itself or was it a combination? Was a doorway opened by geomagnetic fields in the area? Were there truly trapped and angry spirits for a reason? These are things we don't know. You've, you've got to combine all the information. You've got to look through folklore and you have to try to measure it with science and then keep an open mind to all of the above. There's no way you're ever going to be able to answer any of these questions if you don't look deep into it. So, you know, with something like a haunting we will go is, I would say, the first of maybe several chapters, um, not many, but maximum maybe three, on what I need to say about the phenomena for hauntings. And with a haunting we will go, I begin where it inspired all of us, okay, when we were young. And during those formative years where we love ghost stories, we love Halloween, we love horror films, but then you start to experience things and family tragedies and family ghost stories and what the effect is on you at night. And as it goes further, um, young kids tend to... Uh, want to experiment because there's some control over it. So they get their hands on maybe black magic books or Ouija boards or things like that. Some people believe nothing happens when you use them. And for a lot of people, nothing happens. But in some cases, you know, you can have a kid, 14, who was, you know, vibrant and bright before that and smiling and happy. And then all of a sudden, they're in this really dark place. Well, is that just part of life, or is there something that brought that on? If you're in a dark place, or you're attracted to darker things and aesthetics? I know people that are no nothing but a joy to be around, and they love the darkest things. I, you know, my house, or my, at least my office here, is surrounded by dark aesthetics, but it doesn't make me feel depressed, and it doesn't make me feel angry um, or hateful. Very much the opposite, because I could see it for what it is. It's artwork to me. Some people are very afraid. And again, fear is the mind killer, you know. Don't be afraid. But I would say if, <laughs> be careful. Um, one thing I'm very cautious about, and I've talked about this before, and I'll put links to both the Deadlands episode and the Demon Time episode, which is what I'm getting at now with Black Hope, is that if there is a, a darker energy, 
If people are dying and getting sick, I'm not about to dive in headfirst in this for sensationalism or for my own ego. Like, I have no interest. Um, if someone is dying in an area, I think you really, I think you really need a spiritual leader to walk in there. Um, somebody that's bringing the light with you or somebody that understands it, understands how to fight that energy or cleanse that energy. Um, because people believe those energies can be cleansed. And in a lot of cases, exorcisms have worked. Certain cleansing rituals in homes have worked. They've cleared out the area. And this has been portrayed in these movies like Poltergeist. So what is it about a story like Black Hope that makes this one unique against the others? I, I, I think in this case, and there are a lot of eyewitnesses that have that went through this, and it was specifically the houses built over the cemetery itself. So that has to be taken into consideration and that people were seeing apparitions that may have been from that time period and those people, but could it have been something else? Um, and these are those mysterious questions that I think for some are a great pleasure to explore and other people are determined to find the answers uh, because they say more about our existence. They want to further this as a, uh, as a study and as a science. If I explore the Black Hope horror in a future episode of Off to the Witch Presents, which is this new docuseries, I promise it's going to be unlike any exploration of the subject you'll ever see. It's going to be, and it won't be like a haunting we will go. It'll, it'll be the next step. It'll be something else. And, you know, my mind is open to try new things to say new things and also stick with what for me has always been tried and true. And in terms of storytelling and in terms of ghost stories and, and ghost explorations, there are things that have been done for hundreds of years that I personally wouldn't change. However, I think what's been done over the last 20 years has depleted and diminished the study and also the art form of storytelling. So... I'm going to have to uh, get back to work. I really appreciate you listening tonight. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you everything that I've been working on. Um, you know, the next few months are all going to be uh, a lot of writing, a lot of pre-production for this uh, big miniseries. I can't tell you what it is right now. And um, also finishing A Haunting We Will Go. It means the world to me, uh, this new docuseries. It's something that I was determined to do outside of the network system and make something exactly the way I, I feel it should be made. So I'm very happy with it, and I think it's something that you'll revisit. And the phenomena of, of ghost stories and experiences with what we call ghosts is something that I'll eternally be interested in. And I will continue to explore, whether it be in fiction or in docuseries or um, discussion on this show. So, and a little bit more about Off to the Witch before I go. I have uh, big plans for Off to the Witch. And one thing I'm going to do by the end of the year is introduce you to an additional host. I want to expand the show. And so there'll be other hosts for Off to the Witch. I'm going to have uh, many movie projects up ahead. I'm finishing a novel. There'll be another one after that. And I'll be making more of these docu series episodes so the podcast will go on and um i didn't create it to kill it i i created it to uh to make it grow and evolve i'm interviewing and talking to different people that might be a good fit for additional hosts to off to the witch you'll get to on certain nights you'll get to hear them and their unique take on everything and other nights you'll get to hear me that's my vision for this. I, I want it to be something greater and something worthwhile, but I'm overseeing everything. It's not going to be your typical uh, podcast or paranormal show. I would never do that. It's always going to be something unique, and you'll always have something um, interesting to listen to and be part of. And I have many other ideas for the show as well to expand it. So look forward to all of that. If you're a steady listener and if you're a new listener, welcome. And um, there's much more to come, and I will return next week with a new guest and a new topic. And um, 
at some point in the next couple of months, I'm going to have to make temporarily off to the witch on an every other week schedule. So that's either the newsletter or a new guest show. But there is going to be a genuine off week because I need the time to uh, finish a haunting. We will go in the midst of working on this new network project also. It's just so much that I'm going to have to take one of these episodes out every other week. So the show will be on an every other week schedule forthcoming. I'll let you know before we do that. And I'll always um, keep you posted about any changes to the schedule. But the show won't be going away. It's just something I need to do because I take on this show alone. I make the show 100% personally. So everything that's being done, the mixing, the engineering, the writing, everything, I'm going to have to um, you know, create that alternate week schedule. So most likely the schedule is going to be uh, one week off completely and then a newsletter and then one week off and then a guest. And so that's how we have to do it. And um, I'll keep you posted on everything, but also in the newsletters, I'm going to, um, when we're getting closer to uh, Haunting We Will Go, there'll be special discussions and previews and talks about that. So stay tuned for everything. I have to get back to work and I'll see you next week with a brand new episode. Take care.